imagine what strange creature could swim in the lakes of Titan, overshadowed by its big parent planet, barely visible through the haze of the clouds. What could be serenely floating in the deep ocean of Europa, never having seen the light of the sun and perhaps wondering what lies beyond that impenetrable ceiling of ice? Could there be water under the crust of a world so distant and small as Pluto? And so this begs the question, one of the most profound questions humanity has ever asked itself since we started to gaze at the stars and uncover the nature of the universe. Are we alone? For centuries, all we could do was speculate. There were no telescopes, no rockets to take us to the planets, and so the belief in other worlds beside our own and the possibility of other life and civilizations was a philosophical matter. Many people believed in it, but just as many didn't, and they all had their reasons. This all changed with the invention of the telescope. Astronomers could observe the planets better than ever before, and they found they were worlds much like Earth. They could have mountains and valleys, they had moons of their own, they even seemed to have water. The 19th century saw a peak in the belief in intelligent life on our planetary neighbor Mars, after the observations of what looked like canals on the surface, supposedly made by an intelligent civilization. These canals turned out to be optical illusions, but it was one of the things that firmly cemented the idea in people's minds that alien life is a given. To this day, the idea of aliens is incredibly popular, and if you ask anybody, do you think aliens exist, the most common answers are, absolutely. Or at the very least, uh, maybe, sure, yeah. We have been listening for messages from deep space, we have built incredible machines to help us find footprints of extraterrestrial life, and while the search has not provided us with any results, we keep looking. You can say it's just a matter of time, and well, if we stop looking, we'll never know. While a lot of effort is being made to find signs of life outside of the solar system, it's not unthinkable that life could exist on a world right here in our galactic backyard. Let's take a dive into where scientists have looked and will look for life, close enough to Earth for extensive study. Since we can send probes and robots to moons and planets in our solar system within reasonable time frames. Let's start with the moon, about as close to Earth as you can get. For quite some time, people assumed life on the moon was likely, even intelligent life. Astronomer William Herschel, most famous for discovering the planet Uranus, firmly believed he had found evidence of lunar life. In the 19th and early 20th century, the idea of humans visiting the moon and even encountering other people there was popularized by such work of fiction like From Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne and The First Men in the Moon by H.G. Wells, and the first science fiction movie A Trip to the Moon by Georges Méliès. Later in the 20th century, when we indeed sent probes and then people to the moon, the idea of life on the moon persisted, although complex life had pretty much been ruled out. The moon is just too cold, too dry, and its atmosphere is so thin that it offers virtually no protection from cosmic rays and the sun's ultraviolet radiation, which will definitely destroy life even if it could survive in the extremely cold and dry conditions on the lunar surface. Still, the Apollo 11 astronauts were put in quarantine for three weeks after their return, just in case they had brought back some type of microscopic life form that could potentially be harmful to life on Earth. To this day, no signs of native lunar life have been found, but that doesn't mean we should give up. Water ice may be present in the permanent shadows in craters at the moon's poles. Deep down below the surface, there may be places that are warm and pressurized, and may contain liquid water, but this is something future research will have to confirm or rule out. We may find signs that there once was life on the moon, even if it died out by now. Three and a half to four billion years ago, the moon could have had a magnetic field, a thicker atmosphere, and enough liquid water to sustain life on the surface. To be fair, this is all assuming life begins relatively quickly and easily if the circumstances are good. It's not known how life happened on our planet. We're pretty sure it's been around for about 4 billion years, and it's extremely adaptable to all kinds of circumstances. Microorganisms have been found in environments that would kill most complex life. As a matter of fact, most life forms are microscopic, single-celled organisms, and most of them live underground. So it would seem that life is likely to begin and survive for quite some time under circumstances similar to those on Earth. And you need liquid water and an energy source, like the sun, but internal heating from a planet or moon could work as well. 
a potentially habitable place in the universe can be too cold or too hot. At least not for carbon-based life forms like me and you and every living being that's ever existed on this planet. Just so you know, carbon-based life form means that carbon is one of the key elements needed for the chemistry of life. Basically how you stay alive. When there's no more chemistry happening in your body, you're dead. Sorry. Carbon is the fourth most abundant element in the universe, right after hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. The elements nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur are also necessary for life as we know it. And these elements, with the exception of sulfur, are the chemical components of DNA, which is needed for reproduction of living cells. Two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom make for one water molecule. Water is vital for all known living beings, so obviously it makes the most sense to focus the search for extraterrestrial life on places where liquid water can persist, or may have been present in the past. That being said, it's not out of the question that other forms of biochemistry could exist, and life could be present in places that seem unlikely for us carbon-based life forms. More on that later. So it's not likely we'll ever find life on the moon, but what about the other planets? And what about other moons? In 2008, the Messenger spacecraft found water, ice, and carbon-containing organic compounds on the planet Mercury. A 2020 studies show that parts of Mercury may have been habitable in the past, and so it seems even on a small planet that orbits a star so close as Mercury does, where daytime temperatures reach 427 degrees Celsius and nighttime temperatures drop to 173 degrees Celsius, there is a tiny chance life may have existed. This can then mean that life can begin fairly easily, and so could be quite common, even if it's only primitive microscopic life forms, even if it won't last a very long time. It all could hint at life not being too unusual in the universe. At the very least, organic compounds can exist in extreme places like Mercury. Now let's take a look at Venus, sometimes nicknamed Earth's evil twin. This is because Venus is very similar to Earth in many ways. For instance, both planets are almost the same size, with Earth being slightly larger. Both planets are very similar in composition as well, and orbit the Sun nicely in the habitable zone where liquid water can persist on a planet's surface. But I did say evil twin. Venus's surface is covered in thick clouds. As a result of a runaway greenhouse effect, temperatures on the ground on Venus can reach 462 degrees Celsius, and the atmospheric pressure is 92 times that of Earth. The surface is also littered with volcanoes, over 1600, more than any other planet in the solar system. While it's uncertain there's been recent volcanic activity, it still makes life as we know it highly unlikely. Despite all of this, life may have been possible on Venus once. Research suggests that the planet was not always a highly toxic hellscape, but used to have moderate temperatures, which could allow for liquid water on the surface. This period of Venus's history may have lasted for a few million years up to a few billion, which could be enough for simple life forms to evolve. It would be difficult to find evidence for this though. We'd have to build a probe that could resist the planet's extremely hostile environment for long enough to get samples and study them. And it's unlikely that any ancient surface rock remains since the 700 million years of runaway greenhouse effect and volcanic activity. Then what about Venusian life today? It has been speculated that life could exist in Venus's atmosphere. Altitudes about 50 kilometers above the surface have a mild temperature and so it seems worth looking into. In 2020, studies seem to indicate the presence of phosphine molecules. This was a pretty big deal because these molecules couldn't be explained by any process happening on Venus or in its atmosphere. And since the presence of phosphine is linked with microorganisms on Earth that don't need oxygen to survive, it seemed that we had just found a possible biosignature, evidence that life might exist in the clouds of Venus. Unfortunately, on review, it turned out that the data had been misinterpreted and that several errors had been made during the initial research, so there's no significant amount of phosphine and so no potential life forms. Bummer. The search continues. In 2021, NASA announced two new Venus missions called Veritas and Da Vinci. Veritas is to map the surface of Venus in high resolution using infrared and radar imaging to find out more about the planet's geology. Da Vinci will send an orbiter and a probe to descend into Venus's atmosphere. These missions are planned to launch in the 2030s. Who knows what they will find? 
Now let's take a look at what is often considered one of the most likely places we will find evidence of ancient or current extraterrestrial life. Mars. Mars is the fourth rocky planet and about half the size of Earth. The possibility of life on the red planet has long been a popular idea. Astronomer Percival Lowell firmly believed he had seen canals on the surface of Mars, built by an intelligent civilization to transport water from the ice on the planet's poles to the dry areas around the equator. The science fiction novel The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells tells the story of an invasion by the inhabitants of Mars. The book has been adapted in modern media several times and has inspired generations of storytellers to put their spin on an alien invasion of our planet. Mars has been extensively studied by spacecraft since the 1960s. As of 2022, the planet is host to 14 functioning spacecraft. Eight are in orbit and six are on the ground. And so we know Mars would not be a nice place to live. The atmosphere is thin and so it offers little protection from UV rays from the sun. It also doesn't trap a lot of heat the planet receives from the sun. Temperatures range from about 35 degrees Celsius in the summer around the equator down to minus 110 Celsius elsewhere. The air pressure is only about 0.6% that of Earth, so liquid water can't persist on the surface. Mars regularly has massive dust storms. Sometimes they're so huge they can cover the entire planet for over a month, with wind speeds up to 160 kilometers an hour. Any microscopic life forms most likely wouldn't last long on Mars' surface, let alone complex life. So the general idea is to look for evidence of past or present life underground. Recently, samples of soil, rock, and the atmosphere of Mars have been gathered by the Perseverance rover. But to return any samples to Earth for deeper study is for future missions. NASA and the European Space Agency, China, Japan, France, and Russia all have plans to bring back samples of the red planet. And there does seem to be a reasonable chance life once may have emerged on Mars, back when the planet's conditions were more gentle. Mars orbits the Sun just on the edge of the habitable zone, so it's always been colder than Earth. Mars also used to have a magnetic field that protected the planet from cosmic rays and solar winds, and so a thicker atmosphere could persist. Liquid water did flow on the planet once. Clear evidence of this has been found, such as ancient deltas and gullies. There are large amounts of water ice captured at the poles, and there is a layer of permafrost under the surface. Some scientists have suggested that much of Mars's northern regions may once have been covered in an ocean several hundred meters deep. NASA's Curiosity rover found evidence of an ancient freshwater lake that may have been a home for microscopic life forms. Curiosity also took soil samples and its onboard instruments detected some of the key chemical and ingredients for life as we know it. So, liquid water plus key elements for life plus a past magnetic field together strongly suggest Mars was once a planet where life could have developed, although so far we don't have any evidence for this. If it did, it was most likely microscopic. Either way, Mars is one of the primary targets in the search for extraterrestrial life. Even if it died many millions or even billions of years ago, it would prove that life is certainly possible outside of our own planet. That in and of itself would be a groundbreaking discovery. There is a small rocky world in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, Ceres. This dwarf planet is an ancient remnant of the time the planets of the solar system were forming. The Dawn spacecraft made an interesting discovery in 2017. Ceres has a thin atmosphere of water vapor. It was also discovered that there are organic compounds present, and there may be liquid salty water below the surface. Ceres isn't high on the list of potentially habitable worlds in our solar system, but once again, the ingredients for life seem rather common. Moving on to Jupiter, and in particular three of its largest moons. Callisto, Ganymede, and especially Europa seem to show signs of habitability. Europa is the smallest of the four large moons of Jupiter and slightly smaller than Earth's moon. Scientists' consensus is that a layer of liquid water exists beneath Europa's icy crust, which could be up to 30 kilometers thick. The water could stay liquid because of tidal heating. The moon is pushed and pulled by the gravity of Jupiter and the other nearby moons Io and Ganymede. There are several possibilities when it comes to life in Europa's subsurface ocean. 
There may be hydrothermal vents spewing hot water, where life forms could evolve, similar to how they may have evolved on Earth. Life might cling to the bottom of the ice layer, or it might float freely in the water. There may even be more complex multicellular life forms beneath the ice. There is evidence that suggests there's lakes and pockets of water within the crust itself, which could also be potential habitats away from the deep ocean. All of this begs for deeper study, and so NASA plans to send a probe called Europa Clipper, planned to launch in 2024, to do multiple flybys of this moon. There's also plans for a Europa Lander. If the mission can receive the necessary funding, it's planned to launch in 2027 to complement the studies done by the Europa Clipper and to perform analyses on the surface. In 2015, Jupiter's largest moon Ganymede was confirmed to have a salty subsurface ocean. It may contain more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. Studies seem to indicate this ocean consists of several layers and that the inner layers are a good bit hotter than the outer layers. The innermost layer may be in contact with the rocky mantle of the moon, and scientists suspect the mixing of water with elements from rock is important for the origin of life. Jupiter's fourth large moon Callisto is also suspected to have a salty subsurface ocean. There's a lot more water going around than you might think. Speaking of wet moons, let's talk about Saturn's moon Enceladus. It's the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It's covered in ice and so is one of the most reflective bodies we know of. The Cassini-Huygens spacecraft made some amazing discoveries during its exploration of the Saturn system, and Enceladus in particular. During multiple flybys of the moon, the probe found water-rich plumes spouting from the south polar region. In 2010, the craft found evidence of a large, deep subsurface ocean. The water stays in liquid form due to heating from the gravitational forces from Saturn itself and its other moon Dione. Dione may also have a subsurface ocean. The Cassini probe was sent through the geysers of Enceladus, made a chemical analysis of their composition and detected carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen, all key elements for supporting life. There's evidence that suggests hydrothermal activity inside Enceladus, and possibly complex chemistry. This environment could be habitable to microscopic life, and methane found in the moon's plumes could be a product of these organisms. This all seems very promising, but further research will have to find more evidence to support this. Several new missions to Enceladus have been proposed, specifically for astrobiological research. Now, we can talk about potential life on other planets in our solar system without mentioning Saturn's biggest moon, Titan. It's the second biggest moon in the solar system. Just like Ganymede, it's actually bigger than the planet Mercury, but only 40% as massive. And it's the only moon known to have a dense atmosphere. Before the Cassini probe arrived in 2004, not much was known about Titan because the thick haze obscures the surface. But it was discovered that this moon is, aside from our Earth, the only world we know of that has stable bodies of surface liquid. Except it's not liquid water. No, at minus 179 degrees Celsius, it's much too cold for that. Instead, Titan has lakes, rivers, and seas of liquid methane and ethane. The moon has a climate and seasonal weather patterns, and its methane cycle is strikingly similar to Earth's water cycle. Along with a chemically active atmosphere that is rich in carbon compounds, Titan seems like the place to be to look for life forms that have a different chemistry than the life on Earth. This means that the liquid methane and ethane could act instead of liquid water, which is necessary for life as we know it on Earth. Hypotheses on alternative chemistry for life say that life doesn't even have to be carbon-based. Silicon is an element that could perform in a similar capacity as carbon, and ammonia, methane, and ethane can then function as a liquid, and they can exist in liquid form at much lower temperatures than water, like on Titan. It would definitely be one of the most mind-blowing discoveries to make in the history of our species, that life can exist on other worlds, and that it can be built different. But as it is, a lot more research needs to be done. The Cassini probe was not equipped to look for possible biosignatures, and so future missions will have to see if there's any evidence of alien life on Titan. One mission to keep in mind is Dragonfly. This will send a robotic rotorcraft to Titan's surface, and that would make it the first aircraft on this moon. Flight makes it easier to explore and gather data and samples than riding around like the Mars rovers, for instance. 
The mission is planned to launch in 2027, will take 7 years to reach Titan, and will hopefully successfully land in 2034. The craft will be looking for evidence of extraterrestrial life, but also for clues to help us understand how life on Earth may have begun. This is all extremely exciting, but let's maybe not get too hyped up about Titan just yet. The lack of liquid water on the surface might as well be an argument against life on Titan. Water might just be the best liquid for life to develop in, and it could be unlikely or maybe even impossible that it happens in other liquids. Some scientists say we really should be focusing our efforts on finding and studying sources of liquid water for the best chances of finding extraterrestrial life. There are still many things unclear when it comes to how life started on our own planet, let alone a place as exotic as Titan. The good news is, Titan does appear to have a subsurface water ocean as well, and it seems that a layer of water underneath a crust of ice is not that unusual for planets, planetary mass moons, and dwarf planets, even ones that orbit very far away from the warm light of the sun. The biggest moons of Uranus, Titania, and Oberon may have subsurface oceans, although none of this is certain at all since the moons are difficult to study because of the immense distance from Earth and the only spacecraft to ever visit the Uranian system was the Voyager 2 in 1986. Neptune's only large moon Triton has a relatively young surface with few obvious impact craters, meaning it's geologically active. It's bigger than Pluto and its retrograde orbit suggests that it could be a Kuiper Belt object that got caught in an orbit around Neptune. It's large enough that its interior could be warmed up by radioactive decay instead of tidal heating like with Europa and Enceladus, or simply by orbiting close to the Sun. Radioactive decay is the process by which an unstable atomic nucleus loses energy by radiation, making a material radioactive. Radioactivity is actually very common. As a matter of fact, the Earth itself, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat are all very slightly radioactive. You are in fact a little bit radioactive. And so am I. Some of the carbon and potassium atoms in your body are unstable and so you give it a teensy little bit of radiation all the time. This process is how we generate electricity in nuclear power plants. A small portion of the warmth of Earth itself comes from radioactive decay. It's just that our close orbit to the Sun and the molten core of our planet make up most of what keeps Earth a warm place. In an extremely cold object that orbits far away from the Sun, like Triton, it provides just enough warmth and energy to possibly keep a layer of water liquid to this day. Some material on Triton's surface may contain organic molecules. But again, the Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft to ever visit Neptune and Triton in 1989, and there's only so much data that can be gathered at that enormous distance between Earth and Neptune. Any plans for future missions to the ice giants are still in their conceptual phases, and as it is, it doesn't look like any probes will reach Uranus and Neptune until the late 2030s or even the late 2040s. Funding for missions is hard to come by, and also everything in space is really, really far apart. Speaking of great distances, it's possible that Pluto and maybe some of the other bigger Kuiper Belt objects could have had a layer of liquid water beneath the frozen surface as well, kept warm at least for some time by radioactive decay from the rocky interior. It's not known if any of these objects currently have liquid water oceans. Some very optimistic scenarios see life happening even in such hostile places like Jupiter's atmosphere. Water, methane, hydrogen, and ammonia are present there, and these are all needed to form organic matter. But due to constant storms and flux of gases from the upper atmosphere to deeper into the planet, where temperatures are much higher, it's considered extremely unlikely. The combination of organic molecules, water, and an energy source do not guarantee any past or current habitability, let alone alien life. The rare Earth hypothesis suggests that while the ingredients for life seem to be fairly common in the universe, the chemistry that makes life happen needs very specific circumstances and so may be extremely uncommon. So much so that it may happen only once every few billion or trillion years only once per galaxy, or even per cluster of galaxies, or just once in the entire universe. The reality of the matter is, and I've said this before in other videos, we simply have no idea what the answer is to the question, are we alone? 
We just don't know. The only absolute proof of life in the universe is the life here on Earth. So for now, we're stuck with a big fat maybe. I don't see this as a bad thing at all though, it just means we still have so much to research and discover. Keep in mind humanity's first journeys into space happened just a few decades ago. There's still many people alive today that grew up in a time when this was effectively science fiction. In this short amount of time we have made discoveries we could barely even imagine before. William Herschel, Percival Lowell and many others have died believing finding extraterrestrial life was something that is bound to happen at some point. There's no guarantee that we will find any signs of any kind of alien life forms in our lifetimes. All we can do today is keep building and expanding upon the work of those that came before us. This collective effort has gotten humanity to where it is today, with all the negatives and positives and what looks like an uncertain future. But we should always strive to do better as best as we can. And who knows, the next big discovery might be fish on Titan, or squid on Europa, or algae on Enceladus. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new today. Please remember to subscribe, and I will see you soon.